Okay. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging series, where we explore the lived experiences of individuals from the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Um, these people have been willing to share their stories and to share their experiences of gaining their sense of belonging. And without their experiences, um, we wouldn't have a, a weekly um, show, but what I'd like to just say is that our guest for this week um, is a very special guest, and I'm really looking forward to having our conversation with him. He's He's been at Imperial for a number of years, and he's done some amazing things. But I don't want to steal his thunder, um, so we're going to go ahead and introduce this week's guest, which is Professor Hippolyte Amade. Um, and this year, we're going to get to this, he won the Nigerian Prize for Science for solving breathing challenges in newborns. So, Professor Hippolyte, I really want to say a big thank you for being our guest. And I'm going to start with my usual question, which is, can you tell me what it was that gave you your sense of identity and your sense of belonging as you were growing up? Thank you, Wayne, for having me. Um, welcome, everyone uh, who is watching. Um, I, yeah, while I was growing up, I I think that um, I um, got my sense of identity quite early in life and early in my career. Um, I had uh, been visiting um, a newborn unit for the very first time in my life because some circumstances led to the university in question who was looking for a way of tackling a problem they did not even know how to, um, how to face. So, um, and I was visiting the city, uh, south southern city of Nigeria, uh, when I was asked to come and have a look uh, at um, the problem. And the problem was, as they defined it, uh, the problem of being unable to keep babies warm because all their incubators were broken down. As at the time, I, I hadn't really uh, seen one-on-one -on -one, uh, physically a neonatal incubator, but I was um, not new to keeping some uh, things, uh, doing technology that would keep um, organisms warm because I was doing laboratory incubators as well. So I walked into that newborn unit in the city of Calabar in Nigeria, and that was my first time of seeing very tiny looking humans. And um, I was told that these little babies could die if they were not kept warm. And all the devices I was seeing there that was supposed to be incubators, none of them was working. So that was the first time I came in contact with tiny babies, that is premature babies. And um, I had compassion uh, you know, for them and for the problem. And that was how I, I, I identified a problem I could be solving. And it became my sense of identity all the years following. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dress back a little bit, right? Because now he, he's, you've, you've, set up the, you've set the scene as to how you kind of like came into this particular area of um, which you've been celebrated for, and we're gonna go into that in a minute. But what was your background in terms of your studies? Where did you study? What were your main areas of interest before this passion came on you, once you connected with those young children? Yes, when I was growing up, I, I, I wanted to be everything, <laughs> if you like. Uh, and, and everything, anything that sounded good, sounded big, that's what Hippolyte would want to become. But, uh, you know, when it became more serious was when I was about to go to the university. And uh, so at that time, it became very clear to me, I wanted to be a medical engineer. So uh, unfortunately for me at the time, there was uh, 
no medical engineering courses being offered in the Nigerian universities, but the closest I could get to was to enroll to study mechanical engineering. So I became a student of mechanical engineering. And in order to uh, make this effective, my professors at the time advised me that I could take up projects that related to medicine. And, um, and that was how I, I, you know, Providence met it. Uh, mm -hmm. possible for me to visit a hospital uh, in in the city of Port Harcourt called the Body Hospital, where the laboratory scientist there made me see for the very first time a laboratory centrifuge. Mm -hmm. And then I felt that I could create an automatic version of it powered mm -hmm. by electricity. And that, that became my final year project in the university. And that was my major entry into the medical profession. And uh, um, starting from there, I began to uh, put my hands around engineering and medicine. So you, your passion originally was about medical engineering. But, That's correct. But, but the circumstances, for whatever reason, went that you had to go down the route of mechanical engineering instead. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but from that then, that introduction to kind of like engineering in itself, solving problems, you wanted to, you're a problem solver. That's right. Yeah, you're a problem solver. You wanted to solve. Yeah, I, agree, I agree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when I think of engineers, they're problem solvers. You, you identify something and you think there must be a better way. So let me ask that question then. So going into that medical unit for the first time, and when you say that neonate young children, are we talking about premature children? What 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 age group are we talking about that your device was able to um, solve? Okay, if I if I should rewind it back to nineteen ninety six when I visited that very uh, newborn unit in Nigeria, I was shown babies that were uh, just a few days old. Mm -hmm. Uh, between the, the date of birth and the first with eight days of life. Uh, oh, mainly, these were very tiny babies that uh, were just a, a few days old. So my, my um, attraction to solving this problem was uh, seeing such very tiny uh, newborn babies uh, with no hope of survival, like I was told. So I felt that... Um, if there's anything I could do to give them life, then it was worth doing it. Fantastic. So what did you have to do in terms of, can you outline to us what the actual problem was? What was preventing them from um, surviving as it were? What, what was the issue and how did the incubator and how did your mechanical engineering background help in solving that? Right. Um, it's a really a very interesting question because um, uh, don't forget that um, I left the university for the very first time in 1988. I returned to the university to do my master's program, which ended in 1991. Mm -hmm. But I come one on one with, with newborn babies in mm -hmm. 1996. Mm -hmm. So that was actually a time uh, in between. And this time in between, I was already beginning to solve medical problem, but within the field of laboratory science, medical laboratory science. Okay. So when, when I did my final year project in the university, it was a laboratory um, a, a, a device, medical laboratory device uh, is um, um, autom automatic, um, um, uh, uh, automatic um, centrifuge. Yeah. You know, block centrifuge, yeah. And also, so from there, when I left after my master's program, I began creating more versions of um, laboratory centrifuges. And then I graduated into making laboratory water bath, laboratory incubators, and all these things I was doing, I became really very popular across Nigeria within the field of medical laboratory science. So it was during the National Conference of Medical Laboratory Scientists in the city of Calabar in 1996, that somebody told the teaching hospital that a guy will be attending this conference and he might actually hold an answer to the problem of newborn incubators you are having. Okay, so, okay. 
So, so I, I like that. I like that because what you're saying is that actually it was almost like you were headhunted for this problem. Absolutely. Yeah. It was that you, that that they said actually because of your reputation, as it were, yep. um, and people knowing what you could do, they then said, "Well, here's a new challenge for you." Yeah. That's correct. Absolutely, Wayne. New That's challenge. what happened. Yep. Yeah. And so. Outline. I just want you again to outline that challenge. What it what it was that they were asking you to do, and what was the what was the the main problem? The children were the, these neonates were dying, but what was it that you were asked being asked to solve? Right. So so when I when I walked into that unit with the head of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Calabar Teaching Hospital in nineteen ninety six. Mm -hmm. So the, what he, the brief he gave to me was like, listen, we are having high neonatal mortality rates and it is as a result of our inability to keep these babies warm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we do have incubators, but they are actually carcasses because they do not work. Right. We put these babies inside these incubators, but we put hot water bottles inside. Yeah. So they are not really incubators. Yeah. So are you able to transform these cages back into functional incubators. Yeah. According to him, they had tried all the code. They brought in all kinds of companies from far and, far and near, and none could do it. But somebody told them that you have done a lot, and some other devices relating to, um, relating to devices that keep organisms warm, Would do you think you will be able to make these machines work again as incubators? Mm -hmm. At the time, I've never really didn't know I didn't know anything about neonatal incubators, but I had to start. It was a big challenge, so I took away the power park unit, traveled back to my city where I lived, which was the city of Oware, southeastern Nigeria. Then I began studying. I went visiting uh, uh, libraries and collecting all kinds of books in life sciences and trying to read up anything I could understand uh, that will give me an idea of the interface between the machine human interface, as far as uh, incubators were concerned, just to give me an idea of how I could now study the circuitry of this device and then be able to relate it. But don't forget, I had a short form physiology and anatomy, so but this, I still managed to this uh, is, get the system working. This is, this is what I was going to ask you, because you mentioned about the fact that your final year project for your master's, that you had been looking at organisms, but small organisms and keeping small organisms warm is a totally different <laughs> scenario to keeping a, a, a full functional human being with all of its different um, parts alive and warm. So you mentioned about the physiology um an anatomy etc what did you do to upskill yourself what what was necessary in the, to, to get you the knowledge yeah i'm uh, dealing with um, um incubators for organisms which is necessary for laboratory uh, uh tests and all that it's a, a different ball game or or together as compared just like you said so mm -hmm. when i now was challenged with this uh um, a challenge, uh, when I was challenged with this need of creating incubators or making sure that the incubators that were there in Nigeria at the time uh, were put back to work and be able to keep babies warm. Um, I was able to do that quite all right using the technique I, I nicknamed at the time reprogramming technique, which uh, from Calabar took me to so many teaching hospitals across Nigeria. Uh, the entire country that within the space of four years I had become popular across the entire country, across the teaching tertiary hospitals. But my deficiency was that this was not a cultural incubator for microorganisms. This is an incubator for humans. And I needed to understand the link between um, the human and the machine, what I call the, 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 the machine human interface. Yeah. And it's actually anatomy and physiology that will give you that connection. And I was not trained in, 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 in those subjects. Mm -hmm. So it was difficult for me to be able to concisely explain to the practitioners and be able to understand the responses of the patients, uh, 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 with the responses to the behavior of the machine or the behavior of machine to the responses, you know, 
but where so it, that deficiency was there until I got to a point where I felt that I got to go back to school. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so, so here you are, the man who's in charge of, uh, who, who people are saying, this guy's going to solve the problem. If anyone's going to solve the problem, it's him. All right. And yet you had the humility to recognize, I'm, I'm not an expert in, I might be an expert in, in, um, incubators and how they operate but the physiology the physiology is changing the way this incubators the the narrative of my incubator knowledge so you went back to school to upskill or to retrain or not retrain but to enhance your your skill base where did you do it what what did you do and and how did that help you to solve the problem right yeah right when i think um you hit actually the nail on the head when you say humble enough or humility I think that is always my driving force. Mm -hmm. I would not, I would not assume what I'm not. Mm -hmm. And the people that worked closely with me at the time had me several times say that there is something that's a disconnect here, that there must be a, a constant understanding between what the incubator is saying and what the baby is responding to. Mm -hmm. And I could not get anyone to to educate me on that, not even the doctors who are working with me. So it looked like if I waited forever for someone to teach me this within the uh, within the uh, uh, scope of my operation at the time, it was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then again, the work was opening up. I had come to understand that the problem, uh, the the problems that led to the babies uh, dying in their numbers, was not just keeping them warm. There were so many other things. Mm -hmm. I only got to know when I when I got into it. So there are a wide variety of, 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 of interventions that are required in addition to thermoneutral support for mm -hmm. a baby to survive. And as I was seeing this, I discovered that these problems must be solved. And what I had was massively insufficient for that. So I began to search where I could go. I got two options. One option was to go back to the university and study medicine. But studying medicine is still very, very far away from specializing in the newborn. Mm -hmm. So um, the, 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 the advice I got at the time led to my coming to Imperial College. And I was made to understand that I could actually enter into, medi uh, into uh, uh, medical studies midway. Rather than going back to my undergraduate, I could actually step in uh, from master's level. So mm -hmm. I started my master, master's degree in medicine at Imperial College. Then mm -hmm. from there, I had to move on. And uh, with all the skills that I now acquired, I plowed back into neonatology and then began to solve the bigger problems. Right. So, so you came back and did a medical degree, a postgraduate level medical degree. That's correct. In order so that you could solve this problem. So now you're combining the knowledge which you have about mechanical engineering with your with your medical knowledge yeah so yeah. that so that you were then able to facilitate solving this problem or That's at good. least have a grasp on where the problems and how you can best facilitate or best solve them uh, That's I, good. yeah That's good. you know when what thing uh, uh when about research and um, and for 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 my viewers, especially the young younger researchers, I, they, they need to hear this, right? I, this was a time in my career in my life when I needed the right advice mm -hmm. coming from the right people. I did not know how to get there. I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't know how to get there. And I thought at the time when I joined Imperial College, and I was it was I was ripe to begin training on how to do research. Right, I have finished my master's in medicine and I wanted to progress to begin to do a PhD in what I at the time referred to as respiratory support in the neonate. Mm -hmm. Well, neonatal respiratory sy syndrome, you know, that was the kind of idea I had. And I had to go to a professor in Imperial College whom I felt was very close to that because he was an expert in respiratory mechanics on horses. And then I went to professor Rob Schurter, who is today um, uh, an emeritus professor uh, um, at the bioengineering department. 
And um, uh, Professor Schwarzer told me that um, at the time he was actually heading towards his retirement. And he felt that he could suggest that I got supervised by another energetic young man who will be able to uh, match my heavy academic energy, as he would put it at the time. But I told him when he mentioned the name, I said, no, this guy is doing orthopedics. That's not what I want to do. He said, people are listen, you need to understand that PhD does not make you an expert. It only teaches you how to be an expert. So the fact that you're trying to do a PhD would not make, never make you an expert in respiratory mechanics, for example. So go to Anthony Bull to teach you how to do research, PhD research. Then when you are done with him, then you can translate everything you've learned to your passion and you will be as good. And that was why for a lot of people who do not know my connection with orthopedics, that was my connection with orthopedics. So I trained as a, an orthopedic researcher. And then when I'm done, I now translated everything to neonatology. And then I began to fly, not just run. I began to fly in neonatology. And I was able to create all, all these things. Listen, so you're a man of many talents from what I'm hearing, because you, I, I, what I'm loving about your story is that you haven't necessarily pigeonholed yourself. You haven't said, this is the lane which I'm in and I have to stay in it. You've been quite willing to move disciplines and learn from the different disciplines and then apply them. Let's go back then, because you, you've gained all of these bits and pieces of knowledge. OK, now, how did all of that culminate in um, addressing that? How come you didn't lose focus? How, how how did you stop yourself losing for once you had started doing the orthopedic stuff? How come you didn't say, oh yeah, well I can I can I can shine here or I could how did you stay focused to go back to your original? What was it? I think this question where is one of the most brilliant questions because the young people that are watching me are uh, that are learning from whatever, whether, whether you're going to be inspired or you're not going to be inspired, one thing I would want you to go home with. If you're a young person in research, perhaps migrated from uh, 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 low and middle income countries of the world to high income countries of the world, for example, here in, 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 in the United Kingdom, and belonging to the top university in the world, like Imperial College. I need, the, I need to tell you this, do not do full course. If there was a challenge in your country that inspired you to come here, don't get lost because of the vibrancy and the brusterous nature of the United Kingdom and whatever thing that is happening in Imperial College, because Imperial College is a super duper university where top things happen. Don't get carried away. The problem that you left behind in your country are still there. So when the answer is this, the reason I came out of Nigeria was to solve a Nigerian problem. And the only way I could keep myself focused was to ensure that everything I did revolved around that problem. So while I was doing my orthopedic work for every research I was carrying out, I was all the time thinking of how this could play in neonatology in a subdeveloped world. Mm. And whilst I was busy doing this, I was still visiting Nigeria and visiting those units. I couldn't have forgotten those tiny babies. They were the reasons I came out. So when I was done with orthopedics, well, I haven't really done with orthopedics, but whilst I was doing the orthopedics, I was also writing papers in pediatrics. I was still collaborating with my friends, the neonatologists in Nigeria. So, so, so when I have fully learned all the things I needed to learn under Professor Bull, he himself was the person who one day looked me in the eyes and said, Hippolyte, your future is in pediatrics. I was shocked the day he did that, but it was actually very helpful. Mm -hmm. I won't get into the story. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if any person wants to know better about the story, the person should go and read my book, Born to Live, Not to Die. Although I coded the names mm -hmm. there, but you will see part of this thing that I'm saying today. And uh, so someone told me one day, your future in Imperial is pediatrics. 
I felt not too good. But that was the truth. Mm -hmm. And I followed that advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have made the world feel a huge amount mm -hmm. of my expertise mm -hmm. in the whole thing. So I couldn't lose focus because that was the reason I came out. And if any young person is in this country and you love to help the developing world, you can still be able to do it and still be playing your card in that top institution. I still belong to Imperial College. Mm -hmm. And I have solved this problem in faraway Africa. Right. Uncle, I, I love that because it, it, it demonstrates to me that you never lost focus. You always knew what your original purpose was. And all of these other things were just um, not means to an end, but they were means to an end. You knew you had to do A and B and it may, but you didn't ever lose your focus. Yeah, that's correct. You didn't lose your focus. So tell me now, this is the crunch time, Pete. All right. Yeah. You, what was it that you did? I don't know if you're allowed to tell me or if there's IP and all of those things. What is it that you actually did in helping to, to, to solve that problem? Now that you had the physiology, the anatomy, and you understood that and you understood the um, incubators as such, what was it that, that has saved so many children's lives? All right. Uh, when, at the beginning of this conversation, I did tell you that when I came one on one with this problem at the city of Calabar, mm -hmm. my first technique that I developed was called reprogramming technique of yes. new data incubators. Mm -hmm. A new reprogramming technique took the center stage for nearly 10 years. Oh, well, yeah, but uh, more than five years, seven years, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as, as at that seventh year, I had started my sojourn at Imperial College and I had been learning about research mm -hmm. under Professor Anthony Bull. Mm -hmm. And it became very clear to me that the reprogramming technique was deficient in so many ways and I needed to upgrade it. And that was what led to in 2003, I was already at Imperial. I was already doing my PhD under Professor Bull. So in 2003, I created what is today referred to as RIT, which is Recycled Incubator Technology. So I created it while I was still doing my PhD in orthopedics under Professor Bull. And then I now sent it back to Nigeria. Up to today, the RIT is the most powerful technique in the entire country in keeping babies warm in sustainable manner. So I created the RIT. So people can read of the RIT is, is published in the literature and there's a lot that RIT has done, saving a huge number of babies across Nigeria. But thermoneutral support is not the only problem. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. I discovered that there was there was a problem of of uh, there was there was a problem relating to uh, jaundice, there's a problem relating to power. There's a problem relating to lighting the environment because you cannot do neonatal, neonatal, uh, neonatology with poor uh, lighting system. That's, 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 there's a problem, there's a challenge of, of, uh, of the climate. The climate was impacting the newborn babies big time such that many of them could, were, are not able to, you know, to survive the impact of climate. But the professionals never really knew that all these things were really uh, powerful factors against the survival or against, I mean, uh, making the, the babies, uh, 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 you know, increasing morbidity and all that, if you understand what I mean. And there was a problem of respiratory uh, distress. Of course, that was one of the things that actually um, um, attracted me in the first instance, because beyond keeping babies warm, I discovered that babies struggle to breathe, especially the very tiny one, mm -hmm. ones among them. And Nigerians had no solution at the time. They, they did not have any, pro, any, any, any way of helping. They simply give trickling oxygen, you know, through either catheterization or, or just using any tube. And that was not enough, right? So a lot of babies were dying. I needed to do something. So there are, like the way I divided it, about seven different segments of intervention, neonatal intervention that are required. So most of the time when this conversation is coming up, 
thermonitrous support steals the show. Every person thinks that keeping babies alive is only about thermonitrous support. Now I won an award based on uh, respiratory support. Every person thinks that it's all, it's all just about respiratory support. No, there are so many others. And each of these seven segments of intervention, when I have created a concise solution that was solving the problem, if you like, in a holistic manner, and that was what led to the regional ring fencing of Mina Metropoli in Niger state of Nigeria, where for six years, we stopped any other, uh, what I would call contamination of ideas by using original existing ideas. I had to go to a general hospital with no existing um, uh, newborn center because it's by Nigerian classification, you do not do special care baby um, intervention or baby units, what they, what they call SCBUs in general hospitals. They are owned by the states. They are not tertiary. So I went to a virgin land, if you like, reinvent the region, and then set up this neonatal rescue scheme. And neonatal rescue scheme is all about the seven, the seven different interventions covering the entire neonatal practice, the way I've developed over the last 27 years, that is what is operational there, no other thing. So there's no contamination of what used to happen in other places, in other tertiary centers in Nigeria. We wanted to see how much this could solve the problem. And in six, in, in five years precisely, mortality dropped from 90% to 4%. Wow. Yes. So we published this at the, um, earlier this year. Wow. So what that tells us is that this is a proof of concept, problem solved. If any nation wants to move on from there, you got you know what to do. If you don't want to move on, you forget it. So, so you've demonstrated, you've you've designed and developed and delivered, right? So yep. designed, developed, and delivered a solution for low middle income countries to be able to um, rescue and secure neonates who would otherwise have died because of lack of proper incubation, a respiratory arrest, lighting. You solved the whole problem. Exactly. Exactly. Complete, complete problem. I, I'm, I'm clapping here. I'm applauding because that's a major achievement. And I think we, we have to celebrate that. And the fact that, that it's a Nigerian, that you have, have solved that problem is again to be applauded. Right, because I think too often people think that we can't solve these problems. Yeah, and yeah, and when and when can I say this? Because there could be a lot of Nigerians who are watching who joined in this program. Can I also say this? Because I like praising those who will do things others will not ordinarily do. You know, when it is not easy for you to get to an entity and say, "Give me this entity, ring first it for me. I want to make a trial." Mm -hmm. Not in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But this man who used to be the governor of Niger State, he did what no person has ever, no, no governor or president has ever done in Nigeria. He believed me. I'm powered by his wife. So they gave me the opportunity to create this ring fence. And above it all, they trusted me when they when I said. Do not communicate this until we have done it. And I give them the praise. You clap for me and I clap for them. Yeah. Without them, I wouldn't have created a proof of concept. Mm. So we are celebrating whatever we are celebrating today because they believed in me and they allowed me to do that mm. in their state. So when LNNG, and I also clap for LNNG, Right for discovering me, celebrating me. It's not like Nigerians never knew what I was been, what I've been up to in the last twenty-seven years. Mm -hmm. But the people that knew what I was up to were not prepared to blow my horn. Mm -hmm. The doctors and all the people in the healthcare in Nigeria, mm -hmm. they were not prepared to tell Nigerians. In the last twenty-seven years, we've been benefiting a whole lot from this man. Mm -hmm. Oh no, no, no! They all kept quiet. But LNNG found me hit the gong, and the fireworks went off. So I want to thank LNNG as well. That's the sponsors of the Nigerian Prize for Science. They found the respiratory device, Polite Heart CPAP. That was what they saw, and they felt it was very significant. It was huge. 
it needed to be applauded. So they decided to, to visit some centers where they are being used. And when they visited one of them, they got wowed because they saw beyond the polite hands he pop. So all that we are discussing today have always been there. But thank God for LNG. Absolutely. Now you guys are hearing all these things. Yeah. And I guess I've been wondering, I mean, for 27 years you've been on doing this and we didn't know. Well, just buy a bottle of wine for LNG. Yeah, yeah that is it. Hitler, I, I've, I've got so many questions. I do know that I have to open it up for, for my audience as well. Um, so if people have, if you want to put questions, then please do either in the chat or raise your hands. But there's a couple of other things because I know from, from our discussions and from previous discussions that this isn't the only field that you've impacted because as you said, the Professor Gould said to you, your hit, your and um, future is in orthopedics, right? And I no, know my future, my future is in pediatrics. Pediatrics. Yes, correct. In pediatrics. So, what other um, things have you been able to? What other um, inventions have you um, done um, and solved? And as, as there was a, there was another question as well. You said that you you so, kind of like solved the problem when um, you were doing your PhD. And I know most people when they're doing their PhD, that's a struggle in itself. But you were solving a separate problem to the one which you were investigating. Do you sleep? <laughs> because <laughs> how do you do it? <laughs> well, well, let me tell you, I blame it on Anthony Bull. <laughs> and I'm sure if he's watching this program or whatever he watches, he said hippo like is crazy. <laughs> now, now let me tell you what this man used to do used to do when I was a student. If I make a little discovery, I bring it to Anthony Bull. He celebrates passionately. If I pick my phone and call him, I said, Anthony, I found something. Trust me, in the next five minutes, he's racing to my office. <laughs> and immediately he sees it, he sucks it up. He's so excited. And when I come back to the office the next day and perhaps go to his office and say, Anthony, you know, that thing I discovered and I was still celebrating, he said, hey, people are listening. We celebrated that yesterday. Get back to work and go and find new thing. <laughs> so <laughs> he, taught, he taught me how to fire on all cylinders, nonstop. So I blame it on him. I, I listen when, I listen when I, I was all over the place. Just like uh, the earlier question you asked me, I never lost focus. Mm -hmm. Everything I was doing, I was at the same time thinking, how would this benefit the newborn babies in Africa? So it was natural for me to be thinking along and to be creating solutions for them. So the RIT that every person thinks of today that's a recycled incubator technology is, is I mean, it's been talked about all over the world. That RIT was created while I was busy running all over the place as, uh, as a PhD student in orthopedics. That was when I created that problem. Uh, I mean, I created that solution in neonatology. So that's how my, my, my head worked. Yes, I, I had some little sleep, but I don't regret it. When, yeah. <laughs> no, you, listen, more power to you. You're doing, a, you've done a fantastic job. Can I just ask, in terms of um give us a rough estimate you've said that over the past 27 years you have been in get your your system has been engaging in doing this so how many children how many neonates do you think that your system has been able to to save okay that question can be answered in so many ways i i can answer the question from uh, the angle of the number of patients that i've have physically one-on-one mm -hmm. uh, -on -one treated. Mm -hmm. I can also answer it uh, in a way that a certain Nigerian medical statistician answered it. But I think that the statistician's method of answering that question was a lot better because, um, listen, I'm not trained in counting numbers, but when an expert does uh, the number counting, I, I would always bow because that's not my area. So this statistician published an article in 2018 where he claimed that he had followed my work for many, many years 
And he was able to convince me when I confronted him that he has actually followed my work because he was able to name all the hospitals. And from the time I started working all these hospitals and was able to confirm that he knew I was training doctors, nurses, clinicians, and all these people will go ahead, train other people. And that's how the knowledge I created was diversified and uh, my, my, my findings disseminated across the whole country. So by his number crunching, I'm using his word, by his number crunching, he came to conclude that my work had impacted over 12 million Nigerian babies. And because he's a professional, I would have to hang on that. I could not give a better number. Wow, that's amazing. How, do, how does that make you feel? When, Nostalgia. Huh? Say that again, sorry. <laughs> you are asking me how I felt. How does that number make me feel? Yeah. Quite nostalgic. Just can't believe it. You spump all over. It's 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 amazing. It's um it's absolutely amazing. And you are a worthy, more than worthy winner of not just that prize. There should be other prizes coming your way, because what not only is not only is it that you've demonstrated it in Nigeria, it can be translated across the globe. Across the globe this invention can can work and save so many more lives you know and for that again it's amazing and well worth what you've done i can see that we've got a question um sunday do you want to ask um do you want to ask your question or should i ask it for you uh go ahead wayne yeah the question which which sunday was 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 asking was how can we spread this to other countries in Africa? What what do we need to do as a to, to get this out there? Thank you so much, Sunday, for that question. I um yes, it is it is quite possible for um this to be recreated. And that is the reason I celebrate the Amina Center in Niger State. Mm -hmm. This is the place where somebody can walk into even with that Hippolyte going with that person, and the person is able to copy everything that is there and go replicate it elsewhere. So it's absolutely possible mm -hmm. for the thing to move to other places in Africa. But um, do not get me wrong, it is not like this technology has reached every single person in Nigeria, for example, who needed it, or who needs it even as, as we speak, this has not been yet that has not yet been met to reach all the nook and cranny of Nigeria, especially mm -hmm. the remote locations in Nigeria. And uh, people are being encouraged to replicate it. So that's this is not about theory. This this is this is a center that is existing in that country. Nigeria is by far larger than many other countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. So let Nigerians get solving the problem. Replicate Amina Center. I'm not talking, I'm not, I mean, I said there's a general hospital, it's attached to a general hospital. Let the federal, let the federal teaching hospitals and the uh, newborn centers act, do whatever thing they're still doing, but go, go further away from the big cities and then get setting these things up, get smashing mortality rate from 90% to 4%. If what happened in MENA, Happened in other smaller little cities across Nigeria where there are no tertiary hospitals, that problem, you know, Nigerian babies will survive. So that's that's my advice, not just to Nigeria, but the rest of African countries. Go, go, don't wait for the big cities, don't wait for Abuja, don't wait for Lagos. Go to other little cities where there are general hospitals. Set up this life camp. I call them neonatal life camp. Set them up and save all the neonates there who otherwise are not being saved. And Africa will come out of this mess. I'm going to ask you another question. Right? It's related to that. Because there are other incubators and stuff on the market and whatever else. What is it about yours, which means that yours, for, 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 for countries, when we're looking at investment and stuff, tell us about the difference between your incubator and other competitive 
active incubators, which is why people should be, go, I'm not giving you a sales pitch, but why is it that yours is better than, than, than the other ones which are existing? Yeah, okay, when, let me come from the angle of what make many of these centers unable to have either uh, incubator devices or, or maybe ventilators. It's cash. That's what I thought. It's money. Now, uh, I won't mention I won't mention names, but Nigeria at a particular point, that particular time in Nigeria, somewhere around 2008, 2009, there was a there was there was a project of the federal government that they made certain foreign company to supply incubators to Nigerians. So one hospital had one of those devices supplied to them at the cost of 10 million Nigerian naira. Mm -hmm. 10 million, just keep the number. Now in that same hospital, I came to that hospital and I gathered all the carcasses of incubators that never worked in that hospital. And, and about 10 of those incubators, 10 of those carcasses were turned back to become functional incubators and the hospital did not spend up to 8 million Naira. Wow. So what are we talking about? With a cost of one incubator that they had already purchased, they could turn back carcasses. That's what we call the recycle, recycle, you know, recycling incubator technology. These carcasses, some of them are in the dustbin, some of them are in the junkyards. I gathered all of them back, and with less than the cost of one, less than the cost of one incubator, I was able to turn back to work ten more carcasses. So instead of saving one baby per unit time, you are saving 10 babies per unit time or, or, or giving these this neonates thermal support, thermal neutral support, 10 of them per unit time as against one per unit time. That is the economic difference, mm -hmm. okay? So you would have heard Nigeria celebrating the Polite Heart Ventilator. What did it do? It smashed the market cost. Mm -hmm of a normal imported ventilator mm -hmm. from the cost of 6.5 million Nigerian Naira to 750,000. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just economic because, because when these things are so expensive, you make the application a luxurious one. It's only the very rich and the people who live in, in, in the big cities that can access it. Mm -hmm. But when you make it very cheap, you are able to take the technologies to the hinterlands where you have the bulk of the problem, yeah. and the more babies are saved. So I mean, it's quite intuitive, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. A, listen, I could sit and I could talk with you for hours. I know I can. We have spoken for many hours, anyhow. Yeah. And I, I really do just applaud all that you have done. Um, someone's asked a question, and oh, this will be. Um, they said, Professor Charles, do you want to ask your question, or would you like me to ask it for him? Yeah, Mitchell, can I go ahead and ask? Okay, so it says, Professor Alman has um, has done so much, and of course, it, there have been setbacks. In specific or absolute terms, how many federal um, medical centers have benefited from your innovation, and how many home states in IMO too? Um. If I understand that question, um, from the inception of my work in Nigeria, I've worked in virtually all the tertiary hospitals in the country, and I can start naming them. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, if I should put it in percentage, I have worked in over ninety percent of them. Wow. Federal, federal teaching hospitals, um, university teaching hospitals, and federal medical centers. From the city of Calabar to Potakot to Benin to Oweri to Abakaliki to uh, to 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 uh, Makudi to Lafi uh, to um, um, Kefi to Abuja Jabi Guagualada Kano Kasina Yola uh, uh, Maiduguri Sokoto uh, I can go on, Kano uh, Bunguru I can go on and on and on and on I've worked in over thirty tertiary hospitals in the country. One on one, I consulted, solved problems, 
attended to patients, you know, trained doctors, nurses, clinicians. I'm known locally in all these places. Yes, quietly. I go against, I go against, against the tide of insecurity. Boko Haram will be releasing their bomb and I will be busy attending to the patients. But I'm glad that I'm alive to tell my story. Not every person who did what I did survived to tell the story. But it's better I'm not known than that I'm known. Yeah. So you're getting known now. And you're, I don't have any problem. He's the fourth of Nigeria and LNG. Yeah. They brought me out. <laughs> and thank, thank them for doing that. Because I... I'll be honest with you, the first time I met you, I, I had a nickname for you. I went back and I spoke to the other people and I said, do you know Hippolyte, right? And <laughs> they said, Hippolyte? I said, yeah, he's a professor at Imperial. Right? And I called him, I said, he is our hidden professor. Because <laughs> oh my God. he's done so much, right? But he's hidden from us. And it, I'm, I'm hearing why that you were hidden from us. But, you know, all good things are unfortunately we're going to have to wrap up our, our discussion today um but there are two additional questions which i'd like to ask you and the first of those questions they're kind of like back to back um the first of the questions is what advice would you have given to your younger self i've got some inklings right and the second part what would your younger self look at you now and say wow okay uh uh, that question is a little bit tricky. <laughs> right. Um, my younger self uh, will look at me now. Let me start from the first part. Mm -hmm. My younger self will look at me now and say, unbelievable. Because listen, when, when I began this crazy thing that I've done in the last 27 years, it was so crazy that I was taking a direction that never existed. Mm -hmm. If you like, the majority of the people will see the highway to travel on. And I, I will see the highway as being too congested. I'll begin to chart a course through the bush. And all that I was just doing that I didn't want any distraction. And there was no guarantee it would lead to success. So I was prepared to crash wherever I crash. Mm -hmm. And my younger self will see me today and he will say, wow, what a journey. Mm -hmm. Right. So the other one is the advice I will give. The advice will be, do not give up because you can learn to your destination. When I finished my PhD at Imperial College. I guess I was loved by my department. I guess my supervisor really loved me. He would want me to still stay on. The department would love me to still stay on. Of course, when you know what it means by staying on at Imperial, you got to do the job. Yeah, yeah. But I got other crazy ideas, Africa. Now, it was down to, and I, and I want to thank my professors. I want to thank Anthony Bull. Of course, I've already thanked Emeritus Professor Robert Schroeter. He made huge impact, short, but impactful, right? But Anthony Bull, he was the one who bared the brunt of my anger at every time. And that man is a great man. I could just walk away because I wasn't prepared for all the ping pong game of Imperial. Every day come around full. Of course, the life of an Imperial College professor is revolves around the student calendar. If you're not available, for goodness sake, you could not be trusted, the student could not be trusted in your hand. But I've got this crazy African idea. But Imperial College did not push me out in the cold. I was still allowed to return my association and pursue my dreams, all right? So although that course was not charted at the time, it was not existing, not to my knowledge, but Imperial College allowed me to operate in that space. I was fully responsible for all my risks, 
But th at the same time, they didn't push me out in the cold. Mm. So the advice I will give will be, do not give up. Even if it doesn't exist, show your seriousness. There is somebody out there, there's a professor out there who is going to support you. Mm. All the time, the eyes of uh, Professor Bull never shifted from me. He observed me. He still remained my line manager until I became a big man, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you like. <laughs> so, yeah. So the advice I'm going to give any person, I've already I've chartered a new course. Now you know you can do something differently and still turn out to become a professor. I'm, tell, I'm, I'm telling the younger ones now, mm -hmm. you, you must not stay on the highway. If the highway is too congested for you, create a new course. You'll still get there. Fantastic. Hippolyte, a Nigerian winner of the Prize for Science for 2023 and our Imperial College Professor of Bioengineering. I want to just say a really big, big, big thank you for all of the work which you've done, all of the lives that you've saved and the inspiration that you've been for so many people. Right. And long may your your candle shine. Thank may you. it shine very brightly because thank you've done you're doing a fantastic job. Um and we want to just say thank you and celebrate you for, for all that you're doing. All right. So thank you so much. Man. Yeah. I'm gonna just let people know what's happening for next week, but yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing. So for next week, we're going to have um, Julia Topping, and she is a mu She's in the music business, lecturer. She's a junglist historian, a broadcaster, and writer. And she's going to be here. I'm hoping busting some tunes with us next week as well um, for our belonging series. The next guest, um, if you have missed any of the other um, episodes, then please go to our YouTube channel where we will be having. Uh, where you can see many of the other um, <clears throat> interviews that we have done. Um, and finally, I just want to say a big thank you. I say this every week, but it's only because these individuals have been, who have shared their stories about their journeys to belonging, that we're able to continue to have these interviews. And all of us want to have that sense of belonging. And so again, I want to just say a big thank you. And if anyone wants to stay behind just to have a conversation with, with the professor, then please do. But until next week, um, we're going to leave it there. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs>